Hello, Stephanomics here, the podcast that brings you the global economy. And for this special holiday episode, we're sticking to our tradition of giving you a single conversation with someone who has interesting things to say about the world. Food for thought over the holiday season, or maybe just a refuge from all that family fun. As Jerry Seinfeld famously said, there's no such thing as fun for all the family. Whatever the reason, I do know a surprisingly large number of people tend to tune in to Stephanomics at Christmas, even on Christmas Day. My guest this Christmas is Sir Paul Tucker, former Deputy Head of the Bank of England with a long career at the Central Bank of the UK and now a respected author and teacher as a resident research fellow at Harvard Kennedy School. Paul, Sir Paul, thank you very much uh, for joining us on Stephanomics, end of the year. I got to know you as a central banker. You had a whole career as a central banker, a technocrat at the Bank of England, running, among other things, the the markets division at the Bank of England in the thick of the global financial crisis. But since leaving the bank, you've been teaching at Harvard and writing, writing less and less about economics and more and more about politics and philosophy. So have you changed or has the world changed around us? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. It's it's great to join Stephanomics. Um, I think both, actually. In, in one sense, having a new life, uh, nearly a decade into my new life, it was an opportunity to go back and live an alternative life. That's, that's fun. And secondly, um, the world has changed so much that you can't take economic policy away from politics and the really big issues it, it throws up that I, I think I served as a staffer and a policymaker in a much simpler world where monetary policy could be siloed away from trade policy and both could be siloed away from security policy and human rights policy. I don't actually think any of those things are true anymore. You're preaching to the choir on that one because I think with the, even the silos at Bloomberg need to come together. we we'll talk a bit about that. So your, your new book, Global Discord, Values and Power in a Fractured World Order. What's a one-line description of what it's about? Whether or not all the things that international cooperation relies on, whether it in trade, monetary stuff, environmental, human rights, etc., 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 the law of the sea can possibly survive now that there is potentially an existential contest between the People's Republic of China and the and the West. And this is a an enormous change. I see in your your the promotional material the, the publisher says in Global Discord, Paul Tucker lays out principles for how democracies can approach relations with China and other illiberal states without sacrificing their deepest political values or jeopardising their safety. I have to say, when I was reading the book, it feels like it's about how the international system, or I guess what we call the world order as we know it, is going to survive an era in which China is just a much, much bigger player. Yeah, that's exactly right. And uh, and a bigger player with a completely different history, a completely different governance system, completely different deep values... Something, while I promote the book, something I go around asking people is, have you heard of document number nine? And most people say no. It was leaked in 2013, and it is a litany of seven no's. And six of those no's are basically objecting to liberal and democratic values and a free press and everything else. And it is a fact of the world that China is very powerful and it's going to, in my view, it's going to remain very powerful for a very long time. And yet it comes to international organizations, regimes, cooperation with a completely different way of thinking about the world than anything that is familiar to us in our recent history, by which I mean the last 250 years. One early line in your book did chime with me right from the start because you say, when more or less any public policy instrument can be weaponized, geoeconomics becomes integral to foreign policy. And we have been thinking about that a lot at Bloomberg. Cause, and I recently created a geoeconomics squad combining the economics and the politics reporters with lots of people around the world who are focused on technology, energy, international trade, because it feels like all of those things are coming together and we can't even as reporters 
put them into boxes anymore. You, you do you, quite a lot of your book is is addressed to that, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is, and you know the the common theme through all of that is that um, partly because of the new technology, but not only because of that, almost any um, part of economic policy can be weaponized, and therefore is an adjunct of security policy. I mean, when the Ukraine war broke out and Russia's foreign exchange reserves were seized around the world. My, my, a lot of people responded with surprise. My response was, oh, I wondered what the threshold was for that. <laughs> I mean, it was completely obvious to me, given my background, that that could be done. Oh, and that was serious enough to do it. And I guess now, around a decade ago, the SWIFT payment system, doesn't matter what that is, other than that it's a mechanism for sending payment messages across the world. That was used in sanctions against Iran. Prime ministers and presidents thought this was a fantastic thing to do. Um, central bankers thought, oh, that's, that's quite a Pandora's box. So once it becomes obvious that you can use these instruments for security policy, then they will be. And that's, that merely returns us to the past. In the 19th century and the 18th century, economic policy was a regular part of security policy. In fact, debt collection um, was, was, was grounds for war. You talk about the reaction to the Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine. And, and some people did wonder whether we were facing this Pandora's box issue with some of the things that have been done this year. I mean, you talk about foreign exchange reserves. Of course, once you've done it once, you've sent a message about what you might do in the future for example, if yes. China invaded Taiwan, but yes. also giving people an incentive to find ways around it. Do you, so do you think on balance it's been positive or negative for the kind of future that you're hoping to see? So I think this is why the question of threshold is important, because it does exactly that. So you mustn't, you mustn't do something like suspending foreign exchange reserves, except where you think it's really necessary to prosecute your, your case. And I think what's interesting about the Ukraine war in many respects is that it's kind of the first proxy war of the new superpower struggle. I don't think Putin would have been able to, to prosecute it in quite the way he has been able to if, if Beijing hadn't at least acquiesced. Something else I'd say about that is that my prediction, I changed this in the book right towards the end, um, had been that Putin would move against Eastern Europe if and when China moved against Taiwan, so as to stretch an unprepared West on two fronts. And I think that Putin, in a sense, has given away that optionality. Hmm. The West is now going to be prepared on both fronts. But in answer to your question, um, yes, uh, this, will, this will simply intensify the, the efforts in Russia, in China, a few other places, to try to manage their part of the world economy without the dollar. I mean, the dollar is absolutely integral to, to the Western security system. Somewhere in the book, I can't remember exactly where, I say, if, 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 if the American hegemon has an unknowing headquarters, it's the Federal Reserve Building. People listening may start to think that this is another book about the coming war between the US and China. And I've got my sort of personal list. There's, they all seem to talk, there's the accidental conflict and the avoidable conflict and the coming conflict and the conflict that's already upon us. I think we're even going to get another an author of another book along those lines uh, in the new year. And obviously your book is somewhat about that. You said in yourself kind of intensified rivalry with a rising superpower but you're coming at it from a particular perspective uh, which is the sort of interplay between that kind of raw power that rivalry of of two superpowers and the systems we have for organizing global affairs because as you point out you can have great powers emerge we've had the eu become a much yes. a very um equivalent force in many ways to the us at least in terms of people and economically um, over the last uh, 60, 70, 80 years without upsetting the global system at all. So it's not necessarily about having a new power. It's about the kind of power they are. No, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So you know, history is littered with the story of rising powers. And the big question for any of them is how do they feel about the prevailing order? 
And they're bound to want to change it a bit because they want to be more important, whoever they are. But do they basically buy into the structure of the order and the way that gets reflected in international cooperation? We live in a world where all the international organizations bear the thumbprint of the United States and somewhat Europe as the second most important region of the world over the past 70-odd years. And China is different in that respect. And it's when people are talking about the security element of this, the war element of this, lots of people compare this with the Second German Reich, Britain at the end of the um, turn of the 20th century. I don't think that's the most um, instructive comparison, even though it was a dreadful, dreadful, epoch-changing struggle. I think much more instructive is... This is that between France and Britain over the long 18th century, from around 1689 to around 1815. And that was because it wasn't just about where do you stand in the pecking order, it was about different conceptions of power. Our country, we're sitting in Britain talking about this, our country were resisting an authoritarian universal monarchy at the beginning of the 18th century, and a universal revolutionary movement at the end of the 18th century. And Burke said somewhere, the problem isn't France's power, it's that it's the wrong kind of power. <laughs> exactly. And that, I think, captures the, the challenge for the West with Chinese power. And that will, China will therefore understandably want in some degree to have all of the great reorganize, international organizations reshaped somewhat in its own image. And we're not going to want to do that very much. So reshaping it in its own image, just going back to that, that means rejecting quite a lot of what you might call the principles of a of a the liberal uh, international system. Yeah, I mean, it certainly involves rejecting representative democracy, but it involves rejecting a free press. It involves rejecting what they call universal values, which they say in document nine. Um, values that supposedly apply in all places and at all times. They just don't recognize that. Now, in some senses, I think it's important to put oneself in their shoes, which is, I mean, I, I'm not a great fan of the universalist um, claims of Western values. I think countries and different peoples have to find their own way to to liberty. So I'm a kind of pluralist liberal in that in that sense. But they're beyond that. I mean, they're just saying, no, 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 no. We have, we have a, a, a party-led um, country, and that's, that infects, inflects how we want international organizations to be structured. By the way, I think this is a really important thing to say, so I want to say it now, if I may, that none of this is um, to criticize the Chinese people or Chinese history in any way um, at all. I mean, this is kind of remarkable um, um, civilization. And what's more, I, th I think, I came to think while writing the book that countries like South Korea and Japan are incredibly important because they show that you can be a Confucian heritage state and still live by that part of your traditions and be a constitutional democracy. Well, that is just simply not true of the uh, People's Republic. People's Republic, it, it's not so much that it's Confucianist, it's that it is kind of authoritarian and always And entirely has been. about preserving the power of the, the party. party. Yes, entirely about that. I think that captures it perfectly. <laughs> the comparison with the, with the UK and France is fascinating, but people do tend to talk about how this is a new Cold War. And in many ways, it feels like we're a new Cold War, precisely for some of the reasons that you say, that it feel it, we are... Uh, the rivalry, the tension is with a system that is sort of rejecting a lot of our basic principles and wanting to run along very different kinds of tracks. So I guess it's worthwhile just pausing to say how what are the differences with the Cold War? What makes this situation in many ways harder than the Cold War? That we touch each other everywhere in everything. And whereas the, um, there's a passage about the Cold War, towards the beginning of the book. And essentially these were two kind of self-contained blocks with a tube between them. And the tube had two little bits. Oil went in one direction and dollars in um, another. Um, the Soviet bloc had eventually had banks in London, Vienna, Paris, I think, 
Lots of spies. As lots well, of spies. It? Um, it's quite simple in a sense. Whereas I think this really is more like 18th century France and, and Britain. They struggled in famously in, in the United States, on the coasts of India, on the coasts of Africa, on the um, Southeast Asia. I mean, in other words, everywhere. And that's what this is going to be like. China is an absolutely integral part of the world economy, biggest trading country in the, in the world, um, huge manufacturing power. Our economy and theirs are intimately connected. Um, and therefore, this goes back to the weaponization point. Weaponization can be both, both geographically pervasive and field um, pervasive. Now, this creates the possibility, it's only one possible scenario, that, that we will disengage to the point that we retreat into a kind of new cold water. Um, order, but um, but but that would take some doing. I mean, there would be a lot of unraveling to be done to get to that point. Yeah, and actually, as as the economist Richard Baldwin pointed out when we spoke to him earlier this year, it's not just the sort of sexy high tech ways in which they're uh, involved in our economy. They also produce all of our socks. So if we just <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> exactly. so unscrambling yes. that omelet yes. would require. I don't know. Yes. We'd have to get a lot better at knitting, among other things. Um, you mentioned the scenarios. I mean, you do sketch out four scenarios that you come back to several times during the book. Ways that this could play out. Because I guess your time at the Bank of England has taught you not to make forecasts. <laughs> um, what What are those four? The first is lingering status quo. The second is superpower struggle. The third is new Cold War. The fourth is reshaped world order. I think just dispatching the fourth, I think that won't happen um, for some decades until other rising states reach to the top table, most obviously India, um, conceivably Indonesia. I mean, I think for foreign policymakers, they need to be thinking about who are going to be the other big powers um, in a few decades' time. And that would be almost like a new Bretton Woods, only very different from yes, Bretton Woods. That would, would be a whole reshaped system. It would be like table. a kind of 19th century concert, concert of Europe, but for the world. And the international organisations would find they had to be completely reconfigured because the great powers weren't a few European states in the United States and Japan, but um, the United States, EU... Um, India, China, maybe some others, and they were, And if order was maintained in that world, it would be maintained through some kind of balance of power among them. In the meantime, which is going to be quite a long meantime in my view, I think I ended up thinking that we're going to live through a kind of lingering status quo in monetary affairs and financial affairs. The dollar will remain the world's premier reserve currency for a while. That helps American banks be the most powerful banks in the world and so on and so forth. So I think monetary and f the monetary finance field will be a lingering status quo for a while. But everything else, I think trade most obviously, cross-border investment will live between superpower struggle and, and Cold War. Just how much to decouple, how much to disengage. And with, I mean, I wrote the book before all this started happening, um, but we're already seeing it in powerful states in both directions um, don't want to be over-dependent in critical things, whether it be medical stuff or energy or chips or whatever. Um, and I think, I think it's impossible to predict how far that will go but I think that would go on for a long while. And I wouldn't be surprised to see the West reinvent the equivalent of the Cold War, what was it called, COCOM, where the kind of controls that the US and all the big European states had on importing and exporting from the Soviet bloc, they needed to be coordinated. No, no good for, for America to put a block on something if it was flowing into France and Britain and vice versa. And so you know, at the moment, I think we're at the stage where the main Western capitals are thinking about how they want to protect themselves. I think eventually this will lead to um, coordination amongst the, the capitals.
So I just wondered what, what does what does the US need to do to um, lengthen the period where it can continue to have um, the sort of be, be dominant mm. or at least be top dog? And, and, and how is President Biden doing on that front? So first of all, in terms of how important this is, it's not just important for them, but it's important for us. You know, again, we're sitting in London. We live in a part of the world, the big picture outsourced its defense to the United States. The capacity of the United States to provide a security umbrella for our part of the world and for parts of East Asia depends to some significant degree on the dollar because the dollar enables them to borrow more cheaply than otherwise. Um, it provides them with a cushion in bad states of the world. A remarkable thing about the financial crisis is American finance is so weak and so incompetently regulated that it collapses and blows up the whole of the world economy. Any other country you would expect to run away from their government bonds and their currency. Instead, there is a run into um, treasury bills and short-term treasury bonds. So one way of thinking about this, um, an important way, I think, is that Beijing are bound to want to, for the renminbi to be a significant reserve currency. When you see that even the U.S. at its weakest is is supported, fortified by runs into the dollar. It's fantastic. But you touched on the debt ceiling debate. I think this is a really useful way in um, to what the United States should should do and avoid doing. It cannot afford to make big mistakes. And, um, and because the breakdown of silos... People may not understand this. This is a belt within the beltway game about Republican democratic politics. What can the Republicans extract in order to to raise the debt ceiling? But there's some tangible probability that the debt ceiling won't get raised. This is a gift to Beijing, a gift. Um, I didn't talk about that in the book, but something similar. There's a debate about. Um, how the fragilities in banking have moved into the penumbra of the financial system, the shadow banking sector. And I, I mean, actually, shadow banking is a national security issue. Well, that sounds a, a, quite an exaggerated thing to say. Let me put it another way. The West cannot afford another big financial crisis. So the stakes get changed. It's in a, in a world where you think, well, actually, the global order depends on the American hegemon and its European friends. Um, we can't afford another crisis. I think the Biden administration has done well in um, reviving, reinforcing, signaling that it cares about allies and friends, that the United States isn't isolationist. The To be blunt, the silliest thing I've heard occasionally in Harvard or in Washington, well, you know, this China thing, um, we'll be able to see that, see that off on our own. We don't, we don't, you know, Europe's very irritating or whatever. And that basically, that may, that's true if China makes loads of mistakes, but policy should be based on um, an assumption that China won't be, make mistakes. I think China's policy, by the way, should be based on the possibility that they will make mistakes. But Western policy should be based on them not making mistakes and continuing to grow um, rapidly. And I think the Biden administration has done a pretty good job at signaling that it cares about the international order that its predecessors created, many Republicans as Democrats, um, that it knows it needs friends and allies. It knows that involves awkward, sometimes distasteful um, choices. But I am not sure that that has filtered through into domestic policymaking to the extent that it could. And I think the debt ceiling, the, if the debt ceiling goes wrong, um, this Which apart will be from anything an, else, just looks the makes the U.S. look like it's sort of endangering the stability of the international financial system because of its own domestic yes. political squabbles. Yes. So just to, you know, to be clear, it would be arguments in Congress preventing the US government from continuing to yes. issue debt. And so in those circumstances, you'd make a decision either to reduce the proportion of your foreign exchange reserves that were in dollars, or if you didn't do that, probably... If you're another country. If you're another yeah. country, to shorten the maturity of your dollar holdings rather than 
And it wouldn't be that you'd you'd go to a meeting and say, well, the U.S. has had it. That would be a crazy thought. It would be, well, they do seem to be capable of, of self-inflicted harm, and that may get worse, and therefore we should be just a little bit um, less reliant on the United States being you know, the, the great power in the world for the next 25, 30 years. And I think they can avoid mistakes, but only if their domestic politics... Um, take seriously that the world is changing. I think, in a sense, the state of U.S. domestic politics is a product of two things. One is a whole series of really big problems about living standards and frustrations and respect and so on. But the other is the luxury of thinking that their position in the world is secure and therefore they can play these games, and to which I would say you can't afford to play the games anymore. Hmm. It's, it's, this is for grown-ups only now. As you said earlier, though, there's plenty about this which is quite reasonable objectives that any rising power would have. And there's every reason in the world why the China, for example, might want to have the renminbi be a major reserve currency and might want to develop advanced technology. And I guess I just wonder, how do you, how do you think the US or the West should strike that balance between just investing in your own strength and the strength of your example, as you say, mm. avoiding the debt ceiling, you know, mm. making it a good thing to be part of the US system. Um, and on the one hand, or trying actively to retard the progress of the other. Because I was sort of struck by something the Commerce Secretary said uh, a year and a half ago, Gina Raimondo. She said, we have to work with our European allies to deny China the most advanced technology so they can't catch up in critical areas like semiconductors. I mean, even a few years ago, that would have seemed yeah. incredibly antagonistic and kind of unfair to be trying to slow down China's progress. But we're now, it seems we're going quite firmly down that route. Do you think it's dangerous to be signalling quite directly, we just don't want you to develop? I think there'll be phases like that and there'll be phases when it's relaxed. And I think that will go on for a long time. I think the big thing is China is too powerful for us to, to, to be capable of telling them how to reorder their society and how to live. Um, but we can think, and I think it's reasonable for us to think, and, and I have in mind Xinjiang, Hong Kong, elsewhere, but if they treat their own people like that, how would they treat us if they could? I think that's... Uh, and that requires a judgment, actually. It's not that that leads to an inexorable conclusion we could say you and I are old enough to know that for many decades people in Europe were uncomfortable with with parts of the US society's treatment of black Americans. But we didn't feel threatened um, by them. I think that the combination of the way China treats some of its own people and its attitude towards not only Taiwan but other states in, in the South China Sea, the... Um, the northern parts of East Asia as well, means that we do have to be careful um, not to be overly dependent and build our security. But it also means we should find common cause where we can. It's, it's somewhere I say in the book, it's no, it's no good treating someone as beyond the pale um, unless you can keep them there. <laughs> we, you know, it's, it's, we can't. They're, they're and we here. need to work with them on climate change. We need to work with them on climate change. We need to work with them on anything that's an existential threat to the planet. And we need to strive and strive to do that, both because it's necessary in itself and because it's a way of, of signaling to them, yeah, we, we completely accept that you're a power in the world and we need to do some things with you. Yet yeah, there needs to be attempts. I think something that's tremendously important for them to do Washington and Beijing, this is just for them, is to somehow agree de-escalation protocols of the kind that existed, maybe after the Cuban Missile Crisis, I'm not sure, but certainly existed between and Understanding Moscow how the other's and, going to respond yeah, to certain things. Yeah, and that you yeah. don't, you know, if your planes get too close or your, um, ships get too close or something that you, and it's an accident rather than deliberate, that you have a way of signaling actually that was an accident. I thought when there was this business about... Uh, possibly a Russian missile landing in Poland. It, it, that Putin's response to that was so moderate, his words in public, that I thought, ah, all of that may be kicking in in the background. That does not exist 
um, with with Beijing at the moment. So these are things where there need to be summits. I thought the G20 showed its usefulness and Biden and Xi having a bilateral. You imagine the G20 didn't exist. So they've then got to agree to have a special meeting and, mm. and go to it. That's much harder than we're all going to be at, at the G20. It's pretty awkward to not go without sending a hostile signal to everybody. Since we're there, it'll be very, it's a big thing if we don't meet, uh, we are going to meet. And I think what places like the UN and the G20 can do is just kind of things that appear small, but which actually are a big deal. And if we just take it a little bit more uh, up to current day and some of the things that we talk a bit more often about on, on Stephanomics, I mean, it is often observed that on China, at least, the Trump and the Biden administrations don't look so different, or at least many of the Trump era tariffs have been maintained under President Biden. And we've seen, you could imagine um, something along the lines of the action on, on, on semiconductor chips might have been done, at least by a, a Trump uh, yes. era official. Do the odds on a particular scenario change significantly if President Trump were re-elected in 2024? I think so. I think the, the if you like, the, um, the the direct bilateral relationship between Washington and Beijing, not hugely different between Trump and, and, and Biden, f f exactly as you say. But something else was very, very different, could hardly be more different, which is the attitudes to allies. A policy, if you like, towards China is a policy towards the world. You need friends especially in today's world with the extraordinary um, destructiveness of, of weapons. Um, it's, it's, it's having lots of friends that will make conflict less likely and will make some kind of peaceful reconfiguration of the international order more likely. And so a, a huge own goal by the Trump administration was pulling out of the Trans-Pacific trade partnership, mm. which both addressed a particular um, problem in trade policy between China and the West, while I talk about it at some length in one of the chapters in the book, which is absolutely amazing to back out of it. And now, now I think it will be, I suspect it will be quite difficult and ought to be quite difficult for both the US and China to join. Because if, if, if the members of the Trans-Pacific Partnership allow one in, how can they not allow the other in? And then they've just, rep, you know, they'll just recreate all the problems of the WTO. So just in practical terms, if you are a more of a sort of President Biden type administration, and you're, you're responding to some of the things you said at the beginning about uh, building up sort of security of supply chains and not being as reliant on uh, Chinese and, and, and other, um, other goods, um, if you're outside the US, how do you tell the difference between the US defending the global world order by having an alternative to China and just straightforward US protectionism? Because you've got something like the Inflation Reduction Act, which is causing yeah. no end of grief in, the, in Europe. People are yeah. very cross at what they consider to be the quite protectionist measures in that, which involve you know, only using US producers to create... Um, different forms of uh, renewable energy and, and, and other things. It's quite tricky to walk that line and for everyone to think that you're acting on behalf of the, the, the world order and not just the US. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I don't think that example was tricky. I think that's just a mistake. <laughs> uh, it's it's, it's you know, why alienate um, um, Europe over that? I think the way to avoid the trap that you rightly identify is precisely to avoid kind of onshoring everything except where you really, really need to. And there are only very few things for that. So the word friendshoring um, is mm. quite is quite good, actually, because mm. friendship is weaker than alliance. Mm. You know, alliance is a strong thing. We will come to your defence. Friendship is much weaker than, than that. I'm sure your friends would love to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not a state, fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> friendship is the best I can do. <laughs> All right, so you have had this uh, alternative life. You said at the start almost it was you've sort of t taken up this uh, 
politics and political philosophy almost as some people take up watercolors when they ste- <laughs> step back from the uh, step back from the front line of policy making um we're not we're sitting in bloomberg offices now uh, if you're reasonably good at throwing stones you could throw a stone at your old employer the bank of england um with all of this analysis under your belt do you feel lucky not to be in your old job you i feel to- really really lucky to have had the opportunity to do something else i mean the greatest limitation and I, I, I felt this at a number of times during my career. I was a public servant for 33 years. It, and it's a marvellous, marvellous thing to do. I feel immensely lucky to have done it. And the one downside is that it, if you do it right to the end, then that's the only thing you get to do. And it's the and you working for the state, you do it in your own country. I had been seconded, thankfully, to Hong Kong in the late 80s. That was a marvellous experience. But I hadn't lived out, quite apart from Harvard and political philosophy and politics meets economics, I hadn't lived outside this country except for nine months. So just going to live there was an adventure for for us. And, you know, just just made my life really good, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you make everyone very jealous at the end of the year. And OK, your book, which is all of, I don't know, what is it, 554, not that I counted, but something like that, 554 pages. Um, what's the key takeaway from that, and I guess all the thinking you've done this t- all this time at, at Harvard and reflection that you've had time to do? What do you think is the big takeaway for economic policy makers at the bank or at the Federal, US Federal Reserve? Yeah finance ministries on both sides of the Atlantic. What are they missing, your former colleagues, and how does their worldview need to change? It's a, I'm going to say something that will almost sound contradictory, that on the one hand, they need to be aware that precisely because of the weaponization stuff that you rightly raised, that they aren't siloed away from higher level issues. I, t- I tell a story at the beginning of the book about someone walking into my office when I was deputy governor and saying, the Federal Reserve has refused India a swap line. It doesn't matter what a swap line is. It's a line of credit. And my response was, don't they realize India is going to be a power? And, you know, I was saying that's above the pay grade of the central bankers. And yet I also want to say something that will sound completely different. They have just got to stick to the basics, which is delivering price stability and delivering banking system stability in the broadest sense. I don't, they've got involved, not just here in the UK, but very much in continental Europe, very much in the United States. They've got involved in climate change. They've got involved in social justice, inclusive growth. Those things may be more important for society as a whole, but they must do the thing that only they can do. For those people listening in America, in, in Britain, sorry, Eddie George was a very great governor of the Bank of England. He used to say to us, stability, stability, stability. And every time they, they give a, I, mean, I, I wrote my own speeches, as most of them do. It's a tremendously time-consuming, difficult thing. Every time they speak about something else, they are not thinking about the thing that only they can do. My main targets are in the United States and, and in continental Europe, but... So they somehow need to be aware that they're part of a bigger thing, <laughs> security policy, and yet narrow themselves down to de- this narrow but vital um, mandate. And, you know, lucky people like me can roam more widely. So they should read lots of important books but not get any big ideas. Yeah. <laughs> you sound like you mentioned that you're teaching with my old friend and, and boss, Larry Summers, and he, of course, says exactly the same thing about uh, central banks who stray too far from yeah. the lane. Yeah, yeah, we've talked about that a lot. It is really what we each genuinely um, think. And actually, a, an in, a striking thing is that I would say, to the extent that I can kind of informally canvas opinion in my head, I would say most former top central bankers think that, which actually means that we have obviously been spared, we were obviously spared a set of pressures that the current generation is subject to. Um, And as you say, there is this tension because you have to be more conscious of being siloed. Well, Sir Paul Tucker... Thank you so much for joining us on our Happy Christmas episode. Um, You have indeed given us a lot of food for thought. Thanks for having me, Stephanie. It's been a real pleasure. 
Well, thanks for listening to Stephanomics. We'll be back with the last episode of the year, our famous look ahead with Bloomberg correspondents and invited guests. In the meantime, you can find us on the Bloomberg Terminal, website, app, wherever you get your podcasts. For more news and analysis from Bloomberg Economics, you can also follow at Economics on Twitter, and you can find me on at my Stephanomics. This episode was produced by Magnus Henriksen, Sana Sadi, and Yang Yang, with special thanks to Sir Paul Tucker. Mike Sasso is our executive producer. 